Good evening. My name is Neil Stokes, and I'm a librarian with the Los Angeles Public Library's digital content team. I'm really excited to introduce tonight's program. Um, before I do, I just want to really quickly uh, remind everyone who's watching about uh, checking out the library's website at lapl.org, because there's some very important information up there about uh, our reopening and about some ongoing programs that we're doing. So first of all, if you go down on our website, lapl.org, to the rolling reopening section, that's going to have information about everything that's going on with the library beginning to open up to the public again. Uh, you'll also see we are celebrating Pride. Uh, we have information about um, some upcoming programs, including the ongoing summer reading program, uh, lapl.org slash summer for information about that. Uh, really cool online reading program. Uh, with prizes. So be sure to check that out. If you've got a teen in your life uh, who might be interested in filmmaking, be sure to check out our Teen Film Fest. Teens of LA Film Fest 2021. We're accepting entries until June 30th. So all of that's at our website. That's lapl.org. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Corey Siegel. She is the director of the Museum of Neon Art. Hello, Corey. I'm going to pass Hi, things Neil. over to you to introduce uh, our program. So thank you and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for all the work you do for the LA Public Library. We are big fans of the library here at the Museum of Neon Art. And um, we're so happy to be here on the occasion of the release of Neon A Light History, which is a really delightful book that is full of images, full of interesting, juicy tales. And I'm so happy to be joined here with Didia Delizer and Paul Greenstein, the authors of the book. Thanks, Corey. Um, so I'm Didia. Paul Greenstein. Um, great to be here. We're also tremendous fans, um, members and patrons of the library, having done a lot of research there over the years. Um, great fans of the library. So we're here tonight to talk about our new book, as Corey said, and um, and think uh, differently about neon signs and and their history, what they mean. Let me um, start the slides. So um, so neon, a, a light history. It's a short book, just ninety pages long, uh, full color illustrations on every page. It's meant to be an easy read rather than a dense scholarly history. We're really pleased to collaborate with Corey Siegel on it. As executive director of the Museum of Neon Art, she has gotten the museum successfully through the pandemic, um, through more than a year of, of a forced closure, and has in that time expanded the museum's membership and vastly increased our social media presence. She has developed entirely new tours, Remember back when we were on lockdown, Corey was developing walking tours that people could do by themselves and, and learn about the neon signs in their neighborhoods. Really tremendous new programming like uh, the artist talks um, that, uh, that, that happen regularly, um, hosted online by Mona and are available on Mona's websites. It's been incredible to collaborate with Corey. I know a lot about it, I guess, because I'm a board member. I'm secretary of the board of trustees of the Museum of Neon Art. I'm also a professor of geography in the Department of Geography and the Environment at Cal State University Fullerton. Previously, I've also been a board member at the American Sign Museum. So that's my experience with signage, but I'm really the, I'm really <coughs> the professor part of the team. And I wanna thank our supporters who made our book possible. The book benefits the Museum of Neon Art. We don't gain any profit from the book. That goes to Mona. But we couldn't have published it without the support of the Anders Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, as well as our design partners at Giant Orange Press, Randall and Homan and Al Barna. Paul, that's me. it's on to you. Oh, it's, it's me. Um, yeah, just a regular guy trying to do what he can with the meager gifts fate has dealt me. Um, I've been working on neon signs since 1977 in between other projects. Uh, restored a lot of older signs. That's kind of my specialty, especially lately. I restored my first sign in 1978. You can see the picture with the uh, 
the 37 Plymouth, uh, Pontiac, excuse me, 37 Pontiac over there. That was for the Columbia Drugstore, which unfortunately no longer exists. All right. So let's talk about what we're going to do. Um, what we, we, our expertise is so different. Paul, the sign man, and Didi, the professor, um, to polarize our experiences, but we've been. <laughs> uniting our expertise to think neon differently for more than a decade. We've been doing research together, we've written together, and we've been thinking about this together and drawing on our different kinds of, of view and vision and understanding has helped us to, to get to where we are today. We unravel, we seek to unravel little known histories in order to reveal how neon signs have transformed the American landscape and how they help us build community beneath their light. And it all starts out with the inventors um, back a lot further than people really ordinary, ordinarily understand. It starts really primarily with my favorite character, Daniel McFarlane Moore, uh, shown on the left. He developed commercial luminous tubing. That's what neon signs are really called, luminous tubing. He developed that in the mid 1890s. Um, that's 30 years before most people understand luminous tubing to have been developed. And his installations spread all over New, the New York City and Newark, New Jersey metropolitan areas and even reached the London tube stations and uh, Berlin uh, after the turn of the 20th century. Moore's work on illuminating building spaces indoors and out <laughs> as you see in that illustration. Um, his effort was to make light like daylight. And this was before the noble gases were discovered. So Moore used chiefly carbon dioxide or air um, to make white, beautiful white light that was also cold. It wasn't like incandescent lighting that wasted its energy in heat and was dim and red. It was bright as day and the color of daylight. But Moore's, Moore's work, lighting indoor spaces, lighting outdoor spaces, and making signs, bending letters out of luminous tubing, um, was a threat to General Electric, and they bought out his patents in 1912, essentially crushing his efforts. He was murdered by a je jealous electrician um, in retirement in 1936. So almost no one has heard of him. But there is a guy who most people have heard of who are interested in neon. You want to talk about Georges Claude? <laughs> Handing it off. Uh, Georges Claude was mm -hmm. a French inventor of much like Edison. He mostly specialized in gathering patents based on other people's work and capitalizing on them. Uh, his most famous invention, capitalization, was uh, separating oxygen into its various and sundry forms. His company, uh, Air Liquid, is still in business. Um, in our case, he asked Daniel McFarlane Moore if he could fill some of Moore's tubes with neon, which was a relatively new discovery as to how to isolate it, which was one of the things that Georges Claude did economically was isolate neon. So there was a lot of it. So that's a picture of Ron Cathedral, and, and that's a colored picture actually from, I believe, 1912. Yeah, 1910, I think. 1910, okay. Um, so it's more tubing close. lit with neon by Georges Claude. So it was actually this brief window of collaboration before uh, before Claude developed his own patents. Um, Claude in later <laughs> years advocated strongly for Nazi collab, for French collaboration with the Nazis during World War II. He published books and pamphlets and gave speeches about how the French should collaborate with the Nazis. After the war, that led to a life sentence. Um, he was eventually released from prison um, and, and has long since passed away. Um, but his franchised companies, Air, Air Liquide and Claude Neon, um, still exist in many parts of the world. Claude's Claude's developments of, of particular kinds of electrodes and and his techniques for extracting noble gases from air uh, were, were really important and groundbreaking. And by the post-World War I period, by the 1920s, this was a viable technology 
that Claude was able to replicate and franchise around the world. So <laughs> if you can, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this electrode. Um, it's an original Claude patent electrode. It's about, it's about two times as long as a modern electrode. But in the United States by the mid 1920s and late 1920s, when luminous tube signs were really spreading, um, there, were there was lots of competition and lots of other people were trying to make neon signs. You may have heard stories about the origin of neon signs in the United States related to this uh, Packard sign. Yeah. You wanna talk about that? I'd love to. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm delighted. Uh, allegedly, and that's the, the operating word, allegedly, this is a photograph of the original American neon sign imported from France by a man named Earl C. Anthony, who was, among other things, the Packard dealer. Um, this, this sign is now lionized. I believe it's uh, Tenth and Hope at where the Packard dealership was. They have the Packard lofts, and they've made a reproduction of this sign which was so phenomenally impressive that it stopped traffic. They called out extra police. People came from miles to see this new wonder. One small glitch, none of it's true. So, so this, this sign, this picture is probably from about 1929 or 1930 at the new Packard dealership, which was built that year. So the sign supposedly came from France in 1923. So we did research. So we did research in the Spence Air Photo Archive at UCLA um, using air photos to identify the to identify the sign, and eventually found a photograph um, in a time series, and also um, got the original building permits that showed that conclusively that the sign on Seventh and Flower that supposedly was first did exist but existed too late to have been the first neon sign in America. We wrote about that pretty extensively in our book because it's been such a controversy, but it's pretty hard to see the picture. But if you look at other pictures of Earl C. Anthony's um, uh, advertising in the time period, you can see that he used the Packard logo and then he also had a radio station, KFI, so he used the radio masts and KECA, -E um, Earl C. Anthony, and you will be um, corrected he, about that. Okay, um, he he so he used the radio masts and and wires or lightning bolts appearing to suspend the neon Packard logo signs. If you, if you look at that, radio waves, you, right? Radio waves. Um, so if you look at that, then you can see on the billboard a radio mast, the radio waves and the Packard logo sign. So the sign is real, it's just too late to be first. By several years. Yes, yes. So that means we don't know what's first. That's because the technology just, it, people didn't realize it was going to be such a big deal. Let's talk a little bit about the color of neon signs. Oh, this is another That's handoff. another handoff. Another handoff. Wasn't handoff. that smooth, Paul? That was so smooth. It's so smooth, I missed it. Oh. Um, the original neon signs. The original neon signs were basically two colors. There was red, which is the color of neon, and then there was blue, which is mercury and argon. Argon being pale blue, uh, mercury burning also blue and being kind of an accelerant for the blue. So uh, regular argon tubing is pretty pale blue and a mercury argon tube is bright blue. And that was pretty much what there was. There were people who were trying to do white and there were people who were trying to do green and there were people who were trying to do yellow. But mostly if you saw neon lit landscape in 1928, you saw red or blue. Or red and blue. Or red and blue. And okay. red and blue and red and blue and red and blue. Yeah, and blue and red and blue and red and blue and red. Don't forget that. That's right. Now, around the early 1930s in Europe, um, people began experimenting with phosphor colors and that eventually worked its way over to the U.S. by the late 30s and we'll get into that later um, with the, as Didier will tell you, holy grail color of white, white neon. Oh, here we are. So the first big, big, big use of white neon 
Remember, white was the color that Daniel McFarlane Moore created back in the 1890s. They didn't have white, real yeah. white, bright white in neon until it was unveiled in Los Angeles at the Earl Carroll Theater. It, it's, it, white is so ubiquitous in lighting now that we would have a hard time conceiving of, what do you mean there's no white? White is what, what it is. The fluorescent tubes are white. This is what, everything's white. Well, they didn't have it then. So the first use was, as you can see on the screen, the Earl Carroll Theater, 1938, December. And uh, it was a General Electric product, which was interesting because General Electric had always been kind of the arch enemy of neon because they had bulbs. But this was uh, uh, electrical products, put it together, and General Electric uh, sponsored it. And it was white. I get to talk about the geography. So by the late 1920s, when neon signs, whether they were Claude patent or other patents, as they were spreading across the country, they spread together with two other technologies, with reliable <laughs> and affordable automobiles and with expanding highway miles. So neon signs, what's interesting is before neon, uh, there were light bulb signs um, the incandescent signs lit with light bulbs, and those traced a series of dots to spell a letter. Whereas neon, of course, the glass tubing is bent in the shape of the letter, and your eye is not connecting dots. Your eye is reading the entire shape of the word, so just like it does in print, only it's seared into your brain in the light. So neon signs were understood to be able to be read at faster speed. And neon, therefore, was the technology of progress and the technology of the future. So neon signs spread with everything that was related to that future, automobiles and airplanes um, and eat in car restaurants as they spread across the country. Then one thing people don't tend to understand is a big influence on neon in the depression. Why did neon not go extinct in the depression or go quiet? It actually grew because that was because of the federal government. Do you want to talk about that? No. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> I never mind keeping going. I know that. So 1933, prohibition is repealed. And by 1934, everybody wanted to know, wanted you to know that they were selling beer and they wanted you to know that by having a bright red neon sign. Neon beer signs were one of the things that literally pulled the neon industry out of the depression. That and, uh, and a relief project, a federal relief project in the Roosevelt administration called the Storefront Modernization Credit Plan that gave loans and grants to businesses to update their facades, including lining them with neon. So neon flourished during the depression, was shut down during the war by blackouts, materials restrictions, and of course, so many, um, so many soldiers going overseas. Yeah. And then by the time the war was over, everybody was quite anxious to get back to Bright Light's big city, and neon was still Bright Light big city. So they uh, sponsored GI Bill for glass benders. You can see a bunch of glass benders in the center there at uh, a neon school. Right. So the, the GI Bill that has famously allowed veterans um, free college and vocational educations could pay for neon schools. And so beginning in the post-war period, <clears throat> veterans would go to neon school and then together with a partner, typically a wife, they would set up a mom and pop neon shop and hundreds, if not thousands of small neon sh sign shops opened up all across the country yeah. because that was enough to feed and support a family. Also, another thing that had happened is back in the early 30s, there had been really major patent wars between Claude Neon and other big companies, and that was settled in favor of the other companies. So after World War II, it was pretty easy just to set up a small shop, bending glass, making signs. So you'd have a shop with maybe two or three employees that serviced one or two small towns in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. Making, hundreds of them in big cities, and there were lots and lots and lots of sign shops. And each of these shops was locally engaged. They'd make lo they'd make signs for the local market, for the local flower shop, for the you know for for the local grocery store, for the local bar. And that really shows something about what neon signs do. We often think about them as an advertising medium, 
but they also work to attract. Neon signs have a, a geographical agency. They draw people into them, right? They draw people towards them, um, attracting people toward the sign, whether it's to the inside of this uh, corner confectionery store on the left, you can see their brand new post prohibition beer signs on the back wall, or whether it's to this couple's um, Richfield gas station, which also obviously sold meals. They draw, neon signs help to draw people in. Equally, of course, they can be and have been used to distance. This famous photograph by Gordon Parks um, in Mobile, Alabama, shows the ways that neon can be used to push away, to reject, to restrict, and to distance. But also, neon signs have endured disdain. You want to talk about clutter? <laughs> uh, having grown up in the San Fernando Valley in the in the 60s, I remember this. And um, you can just see it's like everybody's got a giant sign, and you can imagine what that's like at night. Now, this, this photo is foreshortened to make it look a little worse. And for those that are connoisseurs, you can see Arts Deli right in the center. So it made it all worthwhile. But yeah, at some point, everybody's Mona trying... has this sign, Dr. Hoffman, optometrist. Yeah, in the Valley Gem Shop, too, I think. Um, you can see that everybody's trying to outshout each other. And when they're all trying to outshout each other, it's just noise, folks. Doesn't really work. So the actual neon sign concept is destroyed so next by overpopulation what this kind of a landscape uh that was called clutter right what that led to was a landscape morality that turned against neon by the night by the mid 1960s so infamously a campaign called Scrap Old Signs was managed by sign shops all over the country. And the goal was to take away existing historic neon signs. They could be signs from businesses that were gone. The signs were abandoned and the signs were still there. There were, could be signs that were working, signs that were not working. They could even eventually be signs that were still working, but that were older and they were taken away stripping our landscape of 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 its neon history yeah and and at the time it made sense because even going back to the real renaissance of of signs in the late 40s with the gi bill um you know you read on the road and and they talk he talks about uh, uh the red brick and neon sleazy rundown cities so neon had already been typified with rundown uh Raymond Chandler, just on and on and on. It's all neon is representative of just decay. And it, it had become yesterday's technology. It started out as the technology of the future in the 1920s, but by the next by the 1960s, it was a technology of the past. Yeah. And eventually, that led the Flor outside. Florian's bar in in you know the yeah. light <laughs> flickers and there everything looks pretty bad. Yeah. So eventually this led neon signs to become endangered. And I hope you'll talk about the technological changes that emerged in the post-war era and well, now. Well, the biggest change was that plexiglass, which had been invented by the Germans just prior to uh, World War II, was embraced by the Americans. And they just went crazy with it. And they realized, oh, we could make, make signs out of this stuff and backlight it and we don't need somebody who knows what they're doing anymore we just print a face slide it in a can put some neon tubing behind it and bob's your uncle you got a sign so you look at the one on the left which requires a certain degree of skill and design and intelligence and by the way is for amf and then you look at a newer amf and you go oh i see now part of that is um you know, a, a streamlining of design. So the one on the right was not out of design, but you see it has a neon bowling pin. Mm -hmm. so. And the tubing was exposed. And and so beginning in the 1920s, the, the, the hip thing to do was to show the tubing, but by the 1960s, hiding the tubing or hiding the light source was the thing to do. So the light source, whether it was neon 
eventually that was replaced by fluorescent, which represented a de-skilling. And then eventually, even later in the 21st century, fluorescents have been largely replaced with LED, which represented a further de-skilling of the industry. So neon became significantly endangered. And by about 10 years ago, it was oh, not man. clear neon was necessarily going to survive. Longer than that. I mean, the, the first big, I don't think it's going to survive, started in the late 70s. So neon has been on its, uh, on its uppers, as they used to say, for the last 45 years. But there's always been neon art. Of course, all, all works of neon as handcrafted works are necessarily artistic to some degree. But let's just say neon art is the work that goes into a gallery space, if you want to make that distinction. It really emerged in Czechoslovakia with the work of Zdeněk Pesaněk um, in the mid-1930s, in the pre-war period. And what he was doing was he was using this still new technological electrical medium and uniting it with human and natural forms. In this case, a woman's torso um, and natural elements like, like wood and tree bark in, in his artworks. Or in Italy in the 1950s, Lucio Fontana, who transformed space with light. Neon art, um, as often represented at the Museum of Neon Art, continues to be a very vibrant art form today. Some neon artists, like Roxy Rose, who made this piece, are also skilled uh, glass blowers, also called tube benders, in the sign industry. Roxy is a woman who grew up making neon signs um, and became a neon artist, joining a movement to make art against oppression. And all of that shows how, how, how neon is and always was handmade. Yeah, there's no one has been able to figure out how to make a machine that makes neon signs because it's glass, because it's heated, because everything is different. Uh, one of the things I've always enjoyed about the neon business is that no matter how many times I do the same thing, it's never the same thing. You're always doing something different. Uh, there's a guy that I work with, Chewy. Mm -hmm. Bending, so the bending the glass tubing over a gas flame. Um, but the assembly of the signs is also done by hand, still done by hand. Neon has, it, neon remains handcrafted by skilled labor in the United States. It's never been able to be successfully outsourced. Yeah. And, and for those of you that uh, were part of the uh, quote unquote controversy about the eight or milk farm, there's your answer. It's being repaired. It's not being restored, but it is being, but it relit. Is being relit and so, repaired. So watch that yeah. space along the Arroyo. Yeah, we'll be hung, hung back in its original place. So watch that space along the Arroyo Park. And for those that like terriers, well, say no more. <laughs> That's the world's biggest terrier. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the, the Ador milk farm sign um, is probably from, it's, it's, it's been moved around to different locations. It may be as early as the late 1920s. Um, and that shows something about Neon's longevity that I really want you to talk about because these are, these are signs that you have an intimate personal connection with that are at this point very old. Yeah, the uh, the Acme one is probably from uh, repeal 1934. Uh, it's using the original transformer and the original neon because neon does not burn away. It, it is it's forever. Uh, if you break that glass, the neon just goes back into the atmosphere. And then you grab some more out of the atmosphere and you can remake that neon sign that says Acme. The on ice is actually kind of interesting. Uh, you can't really see it in, in this picture as much, um, but it's uranium glass pumped with argon. So it's got this very oddball green tint on the outside because the glass is tinted. Uh, Philippi's, which is a sign that I worked on to not restore, but get rerunning. It's really maintain, right? Yes, Careful main, maintenance. maintain. Those signs are, well, on that building, they date anywhere from probably about 1926 through about 1934. They were originally on the uh, 
uh, the original Felipe's building, which was on Aliso Street, I believe, and I'm, I'm sure someone will correct me if I'm wrong, they removed this location somewhere around 1951 uh, when the freeway plowed through Aliso, um, and they just, they just repurposed them. The one on the roof was a one-sided sign that they made into two. The one on the wall there was on another wall, blah, 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 blah. But those signs, if you think about 1926 and now it's 2021, those signs have been working outdoors at night, right? In the rain, <laughs> right? Every night for 95 years. Yeah. That is a level of longevity that Daniel McFarlane Moore, George Claude never could have predicted. I don't think anybody could have predicted that, but a but a, a well, a carefully taken care of, well maintained neon sign. Uh, at this point, nobody knows how long they'll last. Yeah, I have signs that I've restored, and and I underline restored because that's an important part of the quotient um, that have been running for ten plus years without a flaw every night. So this brings us to the ideas of preservation and restoration. <clears throat> which is something that's really near and dear to our hearts. And it's been a really important part of, of bringing neon back up off the bottom, right? That back up away from that endangered state that, that it, has, it has dangled in for a long time. So here's a look at what you might call peak neon. Would you describe some of the things we're seeing in this picture from the early fifties, uh, Paul? Yeah, this is probably like mid fifties, like 52, three. And it's Hollywood and Highland basically. So you see the Hollywood Theater, Pickwick Books. And once again, you notice like every building has its own neon sign going all the way down to Vine. And then at Vine, there was a big cluster of signs. So it was, um, let's say, neon heavy. Now, probably out of, if you were to stand in the same spot today, there might be five of these signs that still exist. So the um, attrition rate has been very, very high. So by the 1970s, gradually a movement uh, was beginning to grow. It picked up speed in the 80s, 90s. It's been growing more and more, so to preserve neon signs. So important elements have been, for example, the Route 66 organizations in every state that have worked to understand Route 66 as an entire ensemble, not just a road, not just a view, not just a town, but also the motel and the restaurant and the neon signs, everything together. And to preserve the road um, as its entire ensemble um, and relight and relight signs al along, along that historic highway. Another uh, important contribution from our publishing partners for our book, um, Giant Orange Press, Randall and Homan and Al Barna has been saving neon a best practices guide for which we wrote the introduction that really serves to help community members who are interested in saving a historic neon sign in their neighborhoods um, and helping them to do that and get that done right. But preservation, <laughs> saving something as it is, is not always enough. So in the case of neon signs that are getting near a hundred years old, living outside, we have to talk about restoration. Yeah, this one was probably built about 1928 on 6th and I think it's Bonnie Bray. Bonnie Bray. Uh, for the Hotel Californian, which was a, a, a an attempt at a high-end residential hotel that kind of failed. And as the neighborhood changed, it failed significantly deeper. Um, in the 1990s, there was a fire city condemned the building but everyone said hey wait a minute it's got these great signs and it sounds like that eagle song you know hotel californian or oh, california oh, wait <laughs> californian oh, wait oh, Cal oh wait okay so anyway the city saved the signs and put them over in los feliz on riverside and los feliz uh yeah in Riverside storage. and los feliz in in a, a little yard that they had and it didn't really protect them that well they got stepped on. They weren't taken down carefully. They were cut up into pieces. But Come X amount of years later, the city sold the site of Hotel Californian 
to a private developer for low income housing. And they said, okay, your art budget for this building is to restore and remount the signs. Now, by that time, one of them had been pretty much given away to a, a well-known actress who didn't do well by it. Um, the other one, which was in way worse shape, had been, in, in these pictures, it actually looks pretty good, but by the time I got to it, it had been cut in half, stepped on, flattened, pushed over. Rusted. It was Rusted. bad news. So um, took it, re remetaled it, found out the original colors, reglassed it. Uh, they paid for a new framework on the roof, and I think we've got a picture. Yeah, picture and there it is on the top right. And of course, it's red and blue. Yeah, red and right. blue, just red like it blue. should have been. Now, the sad thing is that um, the building has since been sold to another concern, and they don't seem to ever turn it on. Hopefully, they will sometime yeah. soon. But uh, when the sign was relit, it was a celebration that united the city council member the developer of the building, the preservation community, the residents of the building, which is low income housing, um, and the and the neon team. And and this is a this is a grouping of people that don't always get along together. So it really shows how neon signs draw people together and build community. Um, there are lots of examples of that, like here at PANS. Another one that I worked on and kind of restored uh, although it wasn't in bad shape it was just mostly um we repainted it and relit some of the letters and it's been and it's been carefully maintained like at felipe's it's been carefully maintained by the same family who opened the restaurant yep. and had it built and who've carefully maintained and even restored the restaurant and restored and maintained the sign as part of that and that restaurant is a really vibrant part of of both a local and an international community. Yeah, Jim knows that the restaurant exterior and interior is as important as the quality of the food he puts out. So he does a very nicely good job. Put, nicely put. Or nice this putter. one, you know, uh, building community can be around loss as, as, as well. And so the House of Spirits was a, a, a really treasured part of the Echo Park community since that post-war neon boom and unfortunately, it the the building burned down um, several years ago. The sign did not, and so uh, luckily, uh, Corey from the Museum of Neon Art and and a, and a group of other neon sign preservationists, including Eric Linksweiler, the president of Mona's board, uh, worked really hard to negotiate with the owners of the sign, the owners of the building, and that they wanted to save their sign. They, they didn't want, they, it was beloved of them, it was beloved of the, of the community. And the Museum of Neon Art was able to preserve the sign. It has had to leave its original location, but Mona is working to find another space in Echo Park and will maintain its commitment to preserving the sign as long as that is necessary. So our goal really has been to talk about Neon's Enduring Light, how neon signs uh, mark important places in our lives and draw us together around important moments like and and important experiences like what do you think that couple was doing at the duplex cottages right i always think it's a honeymoon <laughs> i think they were making cottage cheese maybe yeah. maybe you're right so neon signs have been uh creators of american community uh, for as long as they have existed, which is now well over a hundred years. And that's how we like to think neon signs differently. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, and remember that all sales of our book benefit the Museum of Neon Art, and we're really proud to be able to support them. So thanks. And I'll stop my screen share. Nope. She's back. But we can't hear her. That was so wonderful. And um, I have had the pleasure of seeing Didi and Paul present many times. And each time I learn something new um, and I am re-inspired by the work we're doing at the Museum of Neon Art and their longstanding commitment to this art form and historic preservation. So. 
Um, thank you for that really illuminating lecture. And we had some really great um, questions in the chat while you were presenting. So I'll um, share some of them so you can answer it. Thank you. Um, so uh, one person is asking if there's a digital version of the book as well. There isn't. Um, we have only produced a real paper version. You can order it online, obviously. It's um, shockingly old school. You really kind of want to have this in person. It's just so many beautiful images. And it's a real kind of reference book about neon. And um, they're just, it's, I can't sing its praises more. Um, you really want to kind of dive into every image in a way that, you know, it's also designed to be a book. And, and it's not just that there's a photograph that illustrates a particular point. You know, we're talking about a sign and there's a picture of it. But it's also that um, the, the, the layouts of the book, the two pages are meant to go together. So it is really meant to be experienced as a book. And, and we worked with Randall Anhoma and Al Barna, our designers, really closely on that. And they did a really beautiful job. Speaking of people in San Francisco, world lover SF says, my new life goal to be murdered by a jealous electrician. I can help you out on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Photomaker has a great question. Did anyone experience health issues working with Neon in the early days? Does it have that kind of impact? Um. Not really. I mean, not you're from neon. You're working with very high voltage all the time, so in theory, yeah, you could get a pretty impressive shock from a neon it's, sign. But there, it's very, very low amperage, and amperage is the difference. So if you have twenty thousand volts and twenty amps, you have an electric chair. If you have twenty thousand volts and thirty milliamps, you have a little bit of a. Oops! I wish I hadn't done that. But um. You know, but neon signs have been uh, shocking people. Um, even there's a there's a, a newspaper story about somebody who was badly shocked um, by um, um, installing more tubing in the early 20th century. So, so so as long as there's been luminous tubing, there's been people getting shocked by making mistakes with it. There's also the fact that a lot of luminous tubing has mercury in it. And if you don't handle that properly, like if you lick it, um, then uh, that's not good for your health. And also to quote from uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space, can your heart stand the shocking truth? <laughs> Moving on. Um, so Jennifer Robertson writes, there would be no Las Vegas without neon, such a noble gas. Las Vegas is, we, we left that out of tonight's presentation. It's a, it's Of course it's in the book and Las Vegas is, so important, partly because of what people think of it. People really think now that Las Vegas was the beginning of neon, but actually in a lot of ways, it was more like the end. So um, the Las Vegas was a relatively small and unimportant city until quite late in its history. So in the, in the booming days of neon, um, Las Vegas wasn't a, a major concern. Las Vegas' neon really, really low, rose exponentially in that period in the 1960s, when neon was starting to be associated, had already begun to be associated with negative things. Um, and Las Vegas really cinched that deal, linking neon forever with drinking, gambling, and illicit sex. So part of that slide to landscape morality and, and the turn against neon can be linked to Las Vegas. Although of course it's true that the the, at, at some point, the density of neon and the size of Las Vegas' neon signs were simply more than anywhere else. So it's, both are true. Someone asked about um, if portions of neon signs can be replaced or refurbished to keep them going. Um, yes, they can, but oftentimes you don't want to. Uh, a lot of glass blowers right now, you know, tube benders, will not repump or repair mercury argon because of the fumes. Uh, so a lot of people, they just go, now nah, we'll make a new one, just make a fresh one. Because when you repair it, you have to heat it up and there's gonna be mercury vapor. 
So a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, clear tubing that's like has neon in it, no problem. But then phosphorus tubing, if you repair it, you can see the repairs. So that's also not um, nothing. It's it's not the best work in the world. But the answer is yes. But oftentimes, right. But oftentimes, practically, if a letter is broken, a new letter will be made. Or if a word is broken, a new word yeah. will be made. And it's it's not different. Neon right. is the same neon. Glass has changed. There's no lead in the glass any longer. Yeah. So it's changed a bit. As but, far uh, as the casual eye is concerned, uh, the technology for neon hasn't changed since it was invented. And if you're curious about seeing a neon sign that has been um, restored in, in a way where we add new phosphor tubing to old phosphor tubing, there are some um, examples at Mona of that process, but it is, it's something that is not the safest thing to do because um, the mercury is not really, I mean, it can be dangerous if you hold it or something like that, but the, the peak danger for mercury is the vapors. Yeah, the fumes are dangerous. Ongoing exposure. So you could get a Mad Hatter type of effect if you you know, inhaled too much mercury. Um, uh, I made her laugh. <laughs> so um, yeah, I think um, another person had a question about- um, I was just gonna say one more thing about that. The other thing is when you're dealing with phosphor and mercury argon, uh, the mercury actually burns, the metal burns, and it leaves ash. So a lot of times if you have an old mercury argon phosphor tube and you put a new piece of the same glass on it, it doesn't look the same. Right. You so can tell. If you, if you had a word where you replaced one letter, that new letter would be much brighter, you know, a much clearer color because it doesn't have the mercury staining from 50 yeah. years of use. The bottom of the, of the letter C on Corey is gonna be bright and the rest of it's gonna be a little duller. Yeah, you can really see that um, when you come to visit Mona from Friday from 12 to seven, Saturday 12 to seven and Sunday 12 to five, you can look at our Doc Kills em sign or our Busy Bee Hardware sign and you'll find that there are places in the tube that are really bright and vibrant and then there's some duller tubes and that's exactly what has happened there. Um, we had another question about the safety of having neon artwork in your home. And I was going to go and try and, oh yeah, I could probably um, plug mine in. Well, this is my plug for my neon sign that I usually have on, but it's, I forgot to do that today. But neon is pretty safe. Are there things to consider in terms of having neon in your home? Uh, if you fall on it and smash it into a million pieces, you'll probably get cut up. If you hit yourself on the head with it, that's about it. It's self-contained. It's There's no evil radio waves that are going to make you talk to Martians. There's nothing like that happening. It's also the that... Power requirements very low. Right. Neon is... It, that was one of its early selling points was it was so much more economical to operate um, than incandescent lights. And neon is still incredibly cheap to operate. So that's why you can leave signs on 24 hours a day because they're using extremely little electricity. Um, also, the components are um, in, in many ways largely sustainably sourced, um, or you, know, you could argue about what that means, um, but they're also recyclable, glass, um, glass, metal, copper, right? Um, and the air, the and the the neon and the argon. As soon as you break the sign, it just goes back to the air. It's perfect recycling. It goes 100% back to the air from which it came, and then you can suck it right back out of the air. So it's a zero loss, perfect recycling. Uh, all right, and um, I think those are the main questions. Oh, I can see that um, uh, some of our viewers noticed that the library doesn't yet have a copy of the book. We're working on that. So thanks for pointing that out. We're going to make sure that they have more than one copy of the book. So yeah, we're definitely um, definitely going to get that there. That's, um, you know, it's it's one of the challenges when, when you're a, a small community-based publisher 
and you're reaching out into your own community into a pandemic. <laughs> Um, oh, I have a couple, actually there are two more questions. Um, one was about the sign um, for oh, El Cholo. El Cholo. Does anyone have something to contribute about that? Mm, I don't know what the question is, so no. I just know it's an old sign. I think it's from the 30s, if I remember correctly. Is that right, El Cholo's sign? Uh, yeah. Don't know. I'm not a great sign encyclopedist, um, but it is. But um, El Cholo has more than one old sign, and um, some of the older signs are no longer at the restaurant. I think they're inside. Yeah, there's they at least one of them indoors, which is really great. That's been a that's been a really great preservation strategy to take a really old sign and move it indoors, where it doesn't have to endure the rain and the sun every day anymore. Thought I'd just pop back in here, guys. Um, to Andrea, who was asking about the book, we, like uh, Didia said, we are working on getting a copy to uh, the library, more than one copy. Um, I had a question, and again, this is like a, you know asking about a sign, but um, the Clifton's Cafeteria Neon. Do you guys are you do you guys know anything about that, or could you talk about that? I've never seen it in uh, person. Yeah, it's oh, okay, but. Um, it's, isn't it white? No, it's red. It's red. It's um, clear red. It's, it's it kind white. of a, an approximation of what was originally there. Oh, okay. Well, there is. Okay, so oh, the uh, the one that's inside. Yeah. 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 So oh, the inside, the inside one that was supposedly oh, yeah. on since it was new and all that. That's Not a piece sure. of. So that's a piece of as as I, as far as I know, I believe that's a piece of white tubing. So remember we talked oh. about. Um, the yeah. colors, and we know that white tubing didn't exist in the United States until the mid to late 1930s. It was debuted in December 1938. Yeah. So, you, so that's the so January 1939 is as old as white tubing could be. Now that doesn't mean that it wasn't <laughs> left on, you know, uh, yeah. except for times when there um, was a you know a, a power failure. Yeah. I mean, I I was not living in that closet with the glass since 1940. So I can't really speak <laughs> you, with the you, you look like you were. Yeah, I feel like I was sometimes, but I can't really speak with authority on that. But uh, I yeah. think that story is pretty much made up. Well, they found they, they found know, it behind the wall. They That's found something really behind cool. the wall, and they went, "I wonder if this still works." Oh, it still works, which is tribute to the longevity of neon, right. but nothing else. Yeah. So it's so the story is not really wrong. It's that it's been overstated. It's really it's it, it has happened so many times with stories in the history of neon. So like with the original Packard sign, the sign was real. It really was there. It mm -hmm. just wasn't the first one. So the claims have been overstated, um, and sure. and that's what the problem. I have is. Um, I have a sign that used to belong to the Los Angeles Fraternal Supply Company, who made fezes for Shriners. And I've had it for, they gave it to me probably 15 years ago and I had it laying around. And recently I thought, well, let me put some glass on this and see what happens. I put some glass on it and I bought some new transformers and I was about to wire them up and I said, I wonder if these old ones work. They work, they're from 1940 and they still wow. worked. The sign works great with those transformers. So some of this stuff just lasts forever. Well, that's so interesting about the Clifton sign because yeah, from my research, um, I believe that myth that it had been on since the 1930s. Um, and I think that that speaks to, you know, the general mythology and lore around neon because it's it's something that it's so close to us, yet also there's a lot of misconceptions. And once you, once you start scratching the surface, you just continue to learn and dig. And it's not like, um, the stories become less interesting they become more interesting as the complexity grows but you just hit you just hit it on the head it's more complex you know if someone's trying to sell a story it's like trying to pitch a movie you go well so in the beginning of the, and you lose the customer well if you go it's been on since 1932 then they go wow what a great story it's not really been on since 1932 it's been on since 1962 but it has some of the same numbers in it and you know so it's easy it's an easy story it's another you know another thing about it is that um because neon signs are t 
typically thought of as advertising signs, they haven't been widely covered by the media. And, and that's true now, and that's true when they were new. So that's why we don't know what the first neon sign was, because nobody thought of it as a big deal that they were going to mark. Um, and so um, this means that doing research about neon signs is a lot harder than you may think it is. And one of the things that you really can't do successfully is Google around and find these stories because this stuff was not reported on um, in, in sources that are easily accessible to the internet. So things like the uh, Spence Air Photo Archive um, at UCLA, they're gradually digitizing images, but, but basically they have not been digitized. So you have to, you know, you have to do a, a um, I mean, more and more things are, are becoming available online, but often it's behind a paywall or um, is much more challenging to access than a Google search. Um, oh, I see that someone's asking about the salesman sample suitcase. Yeah. Um, a very neat item that I found on, drumroll, eBay. And uh, yeah, it, was, it was very flattering, actually, because I, I was in contact with the guy that was selling it. And he said, um, he wrote me back and he said, I, I Googled you and this thing has a great home now. And I went, oh, okay, thank you. Um, I can show this. I can show the slide un again. Unfortunately, what you can't see in the slide is that you can turn each individual tube on and off. So you can get different combinations of tubing. And then the really neat thing about it is that it has a little strobe in it. And you can regulate the uh, intensity of the strobe. So you could turn off everything but the red and the mercury arc on blue and then flash them on off on off on off on off on off like that so it's a very there, cool little it's little really item. cool and, ex and except for one tube which is clear neon you know neon in clear glass they're all um they're all phosphor coated tubes so it's it's from that era in you know after the 1930s yeah. when those colors just went crazy and and many of these colors are not like that sort of tangerine orange is not is not a color you see now. So many of these colors are are I won't say extinct, but um, they're certainly rare. We have I think four or five well, salesman a, sample suitcases now. I have a European one that I bought in Germany. I have a new one that I actually take out on jobs, um, and then I have this kind of like homemade hillbilly one that's probably from the fifties also that uh, somebody made. So these were so salesman sample suitcases because if you're um, if you're trying to uh, sell a flower shop on getting a neon sign, you can't bring a neon sign to show it to them. So you want to tell them what kind of colors they can have and what it can really look like. So they made um, they they made little neon suitcases, and the salesman uh, would walk into your business and and show you what neon could do. It's also a terrific teaching tool, and Corey and I both use. Um, a, a modern neon salesman sample suitcase at Mona. And then somebody's asking about were there ad agencies that created the concept for commercial neon signs or was the artistic design concept done by the tube vendors? Usually um, the tube vendors are just uh, workmen. Now, when I first started doing neon back in the late 70s, um, kind of was the, the, the sky was the limit. So I did the design, I did the building, I did the installation, I did everything. Those days are kind of gone now. So the so the tension is, you know, who's doing the design? And um, originally, in a very small neon shop, in a truly mom and pop shop, the person who was bending the glass would have also had to do the design because you didn't have other people. Um, as those shops grew, people specialized, <clears throat> and you had a salesperson, and you had a designer, and you had a vendor. So you had so you had people who specialize because it's highly highly skilled labor. What has happened now is that the design work has chiefly been um, moved outside of sign shops because uh, a restaurant, for example, will have what is now considered to be a unified design concept where their business card, their logo. Um, the paint colors on the interior, the music in the bathroom, and their neon sign are all designed by the same person or the same team of designers. And those are designed by people who are working on screen and who are accustomed to that sort of flat design work, whereas, of course, neon is fully three-dimensional. So um, the, 
old school neon designers really knew how to bring out what neon could do. And there are many people who say that um, that that some designers now aren't so well um, able to do that because they're not accustomed designing to designing for neon. I would be one of those some. Here you go. Now you know. Okay. Uh, it looks like we've kind of worked through our, our audience questions. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for, for coming tonight. That was really a fascinating uh, discussion and lots of great questions from the audience. Again, we will try and get some copies to the library. Um, sorry that hasn't happened yet. Uh, I did put the, the link in the chat where you can buy the book if you want to purchase a copy. Um, Corey, uh, do you have anything you want to say about the museum? I know you mentioned the hours. Let me put up the, uh, this is the website for Mona. Um, I don't know if you wanted to share anything about you guys. Are, you're open to the public now. What, what are the hours again? Yeah, we're open to the public now. Uh, Friday and Saturday, 12 to 7, and Sunday, 12 to 5. And we're so eager to meet you and show you some of our interactive exhibitions and talk to you, nerding out about plasma and neon history. Um, I think it's a pretty fun place to visit, if I don't say so myself. Um, but it's been really nice to connect with visitors after a year of closure. But uh, feel free to follow us on Instagram or on TikTok or sign up for our mailing list. We love to you know, share information, share the light with you. That's so great. Uh, Didi Paul, that. thank you. Oh, go ahead, please. Um, so remember that the book does benefit the Museum of Neon Art. So if you decide um, to buy a copy of the book, then the profits go to Mona. Or if you want to come to our house and buy one from me, the profits go to me. <laughs> I'm just throwing that in the mix. Well, we, we support authors at the library as well. Okay. So okay. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with, uh, with that. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thanks for our audience. Uh, there were a lot of you out there. I hope we got to everyone's questions. Um, please check out LAPL.org. We've got lots of information about other upcoming. We're still doing tons of the virtual programs, but we are also reopening to the public. So you can come and in, in the branches now and browse and check out uh, branches. And, and that's an ongoing rolling process where eventually we will be having in-person programming of, uh, again. And you can find out information about that on our website. That's LAPL.org. Uh, um, and so until next time, I'll say good night. And uh, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. <laughs>